Thank you so much, Alice, for speaking with me today. And I just have a few questions that I want to ask you. And the first one goes back a ways. How in your youth did you become an activist or what activities or beliefs led you to that journey? Sure. So, um, you know, I grew up in uh, what was called an exurb, which means uh, sort of more rural town than a suburb outside of Boston. I grew up in a traditional Jewish family, uh, you know, went to Hebrew school three days a week, had a bat mitzvah. My parents were sort of liberal Democrats. Um, so I wasn't particularly an activist kid and I didn't have activist parents, but I had progressive parents. And so uh, it became clear to me that part of my sort of job as a, a Jewish person in America um, was this whole tikkun olam healing the world stuff. And um, my mother used to say, you know, the Jews are the chosen people, but we're not, you know, chosen by God as something special. We're chosen to make the world a better place. And for some reason, I bought that message. I can remember back in sixth grade, we each had to draw a, a picture of our wish. And, you know, kids were drawing pictures of trucks and bicycles and things. And I drew a picture of a globe and world peace. So clearly in my brain, I had absorbed that message fairly young. And that became sort of a foundation. So, you know, I, I grew up wanting to do something useful. Um, my mother was a writer and I was like, writers aren't useful, little did I know. I'm gonna be a doctor, you know? So one of my motivations for being a doctor was that I wanted to be useful and I wanted to be good. Um, so I was one of these sort of older, ch oldest children who was very identified with adults, wanted to be a good person wanted to contribute to the world. And that's just kind of how I was made up. So I had that trajectory. I wrote a paper on schizophrenia, ninth grade biology. I still remember it. You know, I majored in psychology in college. You know, I was just very laser focused on this going to medical school business. I actually wanted to be a psychiatrist until um, I got to medical school right at a time when there were a lot of very uh, Freudian sexist psychiatrists. And I was like, no, 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 I cannot do that. Although now I know I could have done that, but they hit me at a point where I was discovering feminism and women's support groups and doing all that kind of stuff. So it was like the wrong specialty for me. So part of my um, decision to go into obstetrics and gynecology was that it seemed to me that was, you know, I was in medical school when women weren't going to medical school. So that was a time when I looked around and said, you know, what specialty would be really important for a progressive woman to be in? And it was obviously obstetrics and gynecology, because it was the most backward specialty that I was encountering. In terms of my Jewish upbringing, it was a very, um, you know, Zionist, traditional Zionist upbringing. So I went to Israel when I was 14. We loved Israel. It was this miracle nation born out of the ashes of the Holocaust. I mean, I got that whole uh, myth-making, um, you know, country-building mythology, and I was totally into uh, Israeli folk dancing. And so it took me a long time to examine what are the underlying beliefs and to question them. So that's a sort of more of a what happened when I grew up story. And in college, um, I was in college during the Vietnam War. So I'm part of a generation of people that feels like, hey, we stopped, helped stop a war. We can, we have power. So that was like a big wake up call for me um, in terms of like, oh, I'm just not a little person in the world, you know, going to going to college and going to med school and da, 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 da. I can actually be part of a larger movement. So I got, um, you know, I was a science major. I had almost no liberal arts. I knew very little about the world. So as I um, was finishing uh, college and in medical school, I really took it upon myself to start educating myself about the world and learning about colonialism and imperialism and racism and all the things that really make the world how it is. And so I had that grounding and I was particularly focused on healthcare reform and on women's reproductive rights. Um, so I was sort of chugging along doing that, but in the back of my brain, I knew, you know, I got to deal with how do we think about Israel stuff because I didn't know enough, but I knew that I needed to figure it out. And so in the 1990s, I got, I was uh, involved with a group called Workmen's Circle, now called Workers' Circle, which was a secular Jewish, it still is a secular Jewish organization where we were um, having a Sunday school for our kids and 
redoing Jewish holidays to be sort of secular progressive holidays and all that kind of stuff. And a group of us realized, you know, we really have to look at this. So we started meeting at my house uh, and we started inviting uh, every Palestinian in the Boston area we could find that wanted to talk to us, as well as uh, some, you know, lefty Israelis, uh, progressive rabbis, you know, a whole host of scholars, different people. And we got a very rapid education. And then what happened was we thought, wow, we should, we need to share this with our community. If people knew that the mythology that we had been fed actually didn't tell the whole story. In fact, it told very little of the story. And that there were these people called Palestinians, which I had never heard of in my life. We need to share this. So we started doing events and then we were very quickly blacklisted. So then we were like, hmm, how can we like get around people's fear and prejudice and you know, circling the wagons, which is what happens when you talk about Israel. So a group of us realized we were all uh, doctors. And so we organized a medical project. And so starting in uh, 2003, we started organizing annual medical and human rights project visits to Israel and Palestine. And that was like a huge um, education for me. And I've, you know, I've been going annually except for COVID, either in that delegation or in other delegations you know, doing medical work and exploring health and human rights stuff. So I, it's not like something happened and then I was done. I'm constantly being re-educated and further educated. And you know, I was last in the region in um, Israel and the West Bank and Gaza in August of last year. So, yeah. you know, I had a very upfront, close look at what was happening and then everything else unfolded, obviously. I've gotten very involved with a group called We Are Not Numbers, which is a group that mentors young Gazan writers, 18 to 30 years old, to be better writers in English and to be able to tell their stories. And so what that's meant for me is that I have this constant input of what life is like in Gaza from people who are living there. And that's also um, sort of a monumentally important education for me, as well as what I can contribute for them. I mean, people have trouble understanding a massive catastrophe, but they can understand one person who's lost their father, who's eating grass, who's living in a tent, who's starving. I mean, that's like that's like a real hit. You can you can wrap your wrap your brain around. It. Given all of this, what gives you hope and courage and guides you right now? I my hope varies. I must say, to be very, I, I always describe myself as a pessimistic optimist. My hope when it comes to uh, the issues around Israel Palestine are first of all an understanding that things just can't go on the way they are. This is inherently an unstable situation. And that's what we've seen, you know, with this uh, recent uh, Hamas um, attack in Israel, people who are oppressed will resist. That's how it works. And until they're not oppressed, they're going to continue to resist. So for me, it's very clear that this is an unstable situation, that Israel isn't safe, that Palestinians aren't safe, that we have to get to a place that addresses the root causes of this conflict. The other thing that gives me hope is that I know so many Palestinians who are doing incredible work, who are decent, caring, welcoming people. So there's a tremendous reserve of people there who actually could make things better if they, you know, had the soldier's boot off their neck kind of thing, um, both in Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem and Israel. You know, the, the, there, there is a reservoir of people who are the kind of people you'd want to work with to make something better. I don't have a lot of hope for um, the Israeli government or um, the Israeli institutions changing themselves because, you know, people, countries do not give up power voluntarily and they do not examine their own prejudices voluntarily. And people sit in their own trauma and hold on to that in a very tribal way. And that's how lots of people function. So um, I do think that there is a greater international understanding of what the issues are. I can only hope that the international community will be able to pressure Israel to change its ways. Unfortunately, our government is the major military funder and political cover, but there are huge cracks going on even in the United States. And one of the things that gives me tremendous hope is that if you look at younger generations, both of Jews and non-Jews, there's a much greater sympathy for Palestinians and a lot of questioning about the Israeli narrative, which, you know, right now Israel is functioning as an apartheid state. And we can't allow that to continue to happen, just like we couldn't allow South Africa to continue to happen. And like we need to address the issues of civil rights and human rights in our own country. So, you know, I take a lot of hope in the youth because um, I think the grownups have 
you know, screwed up a lot of things now, <laughs> but um, partly because of social media and the broadening of understanding, just people really questioning what their elders are telling them. I think it's it's a very exciting time, but it's a very dangerous time. You know, and if we look at other issues, militarism, Ukraine, global warming, the lack of universal health care in the United States. I mean, there are huge issues that need to be addressed. And and given the um, sort of right wing backlash we live in, it's a big struggle, but we got to do it. And I have almost 40 year old daughters and grandchildren. And, you know, I want this world to be there for them in a, in a viable way. What advice do you have for young people? You know, I think that when you're a young person, if I can remember back that far, because I'm 75, <laughs> you know, you have all these dreams, you have things that you're interested in, you have things that you love, you have your friends. And it's very important to think about, so what kind of life do you want to live? And how do you want to either contribute to the world or not contribute to the world. And I think that young people need to think about, okay, what do I have passion about? So if it's, you know, fighting global warming or whatever, then you need to think about, okay, how can I work that into my life? Or do I study it in college? Do I join a community group that works on these issues? Do I just educate myself and my community? As an individual, you, you have power, but you have greater power in community. So for, for young people, I think it's important to take these questions very seriously because your choices will actually determine what kind of world we live in. You can decide, you know, that you're very interested in X, Y, Z, then you've got to pursue it and you've got to study it and you've got to work towards it. And so I think taking those kind of decisions seriously and not sort of thinking, well, it's somebody else's job or, you know, I can't possibly change that or whatever, that you can change things and that you can find community to work together to, to make a difference. I mean, look at the role of youth in alerting the world to the catastrophe of global warming. It is powerful. And youth are the people that are going to have to live in this hotter planet. You have the power of uh, urgency because it's the planet that you're going to be living your whole life in. So I think youth has a particular uh, voice and that you make life choices like you know, my life choice to get through medical school, become a doctor, you know, was motivated by wanting to help people and wanting to have health care for people. And when I went into OBGYN, wanting to have women educated and making choices and autonomy and defending their reproductive rights. So, you know, a childhood dream of being a good person and making a difference was translated into the work that I chose to do. So you don't have to be like a professional person. You could do all sorts of things related to improving the world. And I think that you should be thinking about the big picture when you make your choices. So um, so I have three books for adults about uh, Israel-Palestine and health and human rights. And then last year I published a, uh, or Kuhn Press published my young adult book called Finding Melody Sullivan at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, uh, they published my middle grade book uh, called Old Enough to Know. Um, so I have two books for kids of different age groups that I hope people will read. Um, they're, they're both Palestine focused, but they're novels, they're stories. They're, it's not teaching you a lesson, it's a fun or complicated, interesting read. Um, I also uh, wrote uh, a graphic novel and I have an artist in Gaza who is illustrating it. He's illustrated the first 42 pages and he's working on, a, he's got about five more pages and then the rest of the book. And he's actually been working on it now without, you know, whenever he has electricity, he'll wow. do some sketches and he'll send them to me. It's just amazing. So he's really illustrating from his gut and from his heart. And so hopefully, there will be a ceasefire and he will be able to complete the book along with all the other things that should come from a ceasefire. And then um, we'll have a graphic novel as well, which would be for young adults and adults. It's not a, a middle grade graphic novel. I also have um, a, a documentary film that's good for all ages called Voices Across the Divide. So if um, young people are interested in just exploring the history of the region through the voices of Palestinians, because we usually just get the Israeli view, a uh, Jewish Israeli view. It's a you know 55 minute film available on Vimeo. It's been at film festivals and that kind of thing. So it's another uh, way to painlessly learn about this region. And also to one of the issues is the Palestinians have been so demonized. And so he hearing people, you know, if you hear like, well, in 1948, 750,000 people were dispossessed. That kind of like blank over your face. But if you hear one guy's talking about when he was a kid and what it was like to 
to have 1948 happen in the middle of his life. It's very powerful and it makes it very real. And it also makes Palestinians very human. So that's absolutely critical. And and the other thing I think as young people, you can see, and this is like a, a sort of a new thought that I think is now prevalent, um, the whole issue of intersectionality. So you may understand the story of Palestinians, but you also then understand the story of other people who've been dispossessed, other people who have been the victims of bigotry, African-Americans supporting Palestinians. Why is that? You know, So there are ways to look at these things across uh, different populations and different issues too. Thank you so much for taking time Thank to you. talk today. And I really appreciate hearing you and I'll be, I'm excited to get this up on our website.